Charles I, painted by Sir Anthony van Dyck in 1635. From 100 Masterpieces of Painting by John Lafarge. The portrait of Charles is one of the most famous. Its entire composition has the appearance of a story, of some poetic description of part of an important event. The king is in riding costume, in a white satin jacket, red hose, and light yellow leather jack boots, with a wide brimmed black hat, slightly tilted, under which drops the long cavalier hair. One lock touches his wide collar, and a pearl hangs from the ear beneath it. The king's grey horse drops its head, champing the bit, and the groom holds it back. Another attendant holds in his hands the king's silk riding cloak. The loneliness that belongs to kings attends Charles, who stands a little away from horse and attendants, and the trees that edge the woods he has left. Every trifle in his equipment and in his gestures makes him out the type of the gentleman aristocrat by birth, by feeling, by training, by prejudice, and by unconscious assertion. His right hand presses his tall cane with gentle authority. The gloved left hand, bent upon the hip, holds the other glove with open fingers, elegantly spread. The feet and legs, cased in the elegant fashion of the day, press firmly but lightly with a gentle stride. The king is all that there is there. All else is but a setting, and all and anything, every line, every means of dark and light, carry to one point the eye of the royal face looking at us, part of the general spectacle, with eyebrows lightly raised, with lids slightly drooped, with a clear but not insistent vision, perhaps the expression of conscious superiority. In marvellous elegance the divine right of kings is here shown. The solitariness that belongs to certain refinements is here pictured as never elsewhere and the melancholy of this perception by the painter reminds us of the fate of his hero. History is written there, the things that were to be. This manner of courtesy, of aristocratic elegance, is carried out even in the big landscapes of the portraits. In whatever fills in the architecture of the pictures, meant to hang on splendid walls as fresh testimonies to pride of place and mirroring of fashion, the picture of well-born fashion has never since been so beautifully expressed. There is still with Van Dyck's portraits some reflection of a more heroic age, and the mark of ancestry, both in the subjects and the painter's reminiscence of greater art, separates these portraits from other later masterpieces, equally fashionable and sometimes almost as beautiful, where the subjects of the portraits do not affirm themselves as of undoubted blue blood, and as living in the manner of superiority absolutely unchallenged. To obtain such results, some of the meaning in each face has to be felt out, some of the experience of life which is separate for each one of us, some of that hardness or softness or special character which we have by ourselves when we are no longer dressed for public. In that, the portraits of Van Dyck begin a new era in painting. They are more the representation of what a person of distinction would like to appear to be than what he really is, when seen more than once on some occasion of show or festivity. A little of this polite view of reality can be seen in the Titians before Van Dyck. But after Van Dyck, it marks throughout the whole modern history a special way of looking at portraiture, a society manner, putting aside the individual and the main question. In England, it becomes the special mark. In Spain, the older idea persists, and even into the 19th century, the unflattering representation of royalty or importance continues unbroken. It is as if Spanish pride of ancestry and of character were too great to allow for the smaller weakness of vanity.